Thank you, everybody. Welcome. Uh, as the man said, my name is Trevor Miller. I own a business called Liberty Root Therapy Limited. We use a plant medicine called Idlegain, mostly to treat addictions. I'll still tell you a little bit about that in a second. But first, our trip today, the journey I'd like to take us on trip, get it? Yeah. <laughs> I'll give a bit further introduction on myself. I'll speak a little bit about psychedelics and how they've impacted my life. I'll speak a little bit about entrepreneurship and how I came into that. And then where those two paths met for me and where they might meet for you. And that's how I'm going to leave it is with some tools that you might use. I put it in the psychedelic entrepreneur's suitcase so that if you too maybe wanted to take a journey similar to mine, I'll give you some tools that have really helped me along the way. So I was invited by Kevin to speak at last year's forum. I spoke a lot and directly about the work that I do with Ibogain. I shared the stage with my friend Gabor Mate. And um, the work that we do is we bring people in for 10 days at a time, mostly opiate addicts and we give them a plant medicine called Ibogaine, which comes out of Africa, and we seem to have a 65 to 75% success rate treating opiate addicts, specifically, uh, or mostly opiate addicts, but it works great for all addiction. And uh, I'm not gonna go too much into the work that we do at Liberty Root. I do encourage you to learn more about Ibogaine, though. If you do wanna see that talk, if you go to YouTube and type Trevor Miller Gabor Mate, you'll find that talk, and I really encourage you to do because we are facing a crisis in BC specifically, but around the world regarding opiates, and Ibogaine needs, there needs more awareness about the powerful impact that can have in interrupting opiate addiction when really nothing else seems to be doing that. So, Speaking about a psychedelic entrepreneur, so Kevin invited me to speak this year, and he, he said, do you want to speak at this year's forum? I said, sure. I went online, went to the website, and it looked like I was just sharing, uh, I'm speaking in a forum next, that I was sharing this panel with Rick Doblin and Bruce Tobin, which was great for me. It meant I didn't need to prepare my own talk. And uh, then... Uh, Kevin called me up a few days later and said, so what are you going to speak about? I'm like, oh, you are going to give me my own slot? He said, yeah. And I said, well, give me a couple days to think about it, because I already spoke about Ibogaine. And I came back a day later and said, how about I speak about psychedelic entrepreneurship? And he said, great idea. You're the perfect guy to speak about that, having started the business you have. And I don't think it's been talked about at one of these things before. So I said, great, I'll speak about that. And then a couple more weeks passed, and I started getting really nervous about this topic. Number one, <coughs> Iboga and Ibogaine, it's, it's the most potentially dangerous psychedelic available. It, anybody that I know that, is, that works with that plant medicine has really directly felt a call to work with that medicine. So I didn't want to just go and invite everybody to start working with Ibogaine, because like I said, you feel a call if you're going to be working with Ibogaine. On the other hand, I don't want to end up in jail for encouraging people and teaching people how to provide illicit, illicit substances to people. Because Ibogaine, while it's dangerous, it is still currently legal within Canada. So while most of the psychedelics, as we know, are not. So thankfully, I was hit by a bit of inspiration that hopefully allows me to bring value to everybody in the room, whether or not you plan on working with a specific substance. So this is the Google definition of psychedelic. I think it's funny that it says especially LSD. I don't know how the other plant medicines feel about that. But uh, I don't think I need to explain to a room like this what a psychedelic is in the dictionary definition of the term. But I like the etymology and where this word came from. This is the man, Humphrey Osmond, who coined the term psychedelic. And he did a lot of great work with psychedelics out of Weyburn, Saskatchewan. He, they had at least a 50% success rate treating alcoholics with LSD. But him and Aldous Huxley were batting around different words that they might use for these substances they'd been working with. And Humphrey Osmond came up with psychedelic, and it comes from the Greek psyche, and psyche, often, most people think that psychedelic means mind manifesting, and that's a great definition alone for psychedelic, is mind manifesting. But as Richard Jensen would be quick to point out, Humphrey Osmond would have known that psyche really first talks about the spirit or soul, 
and then the delic part of it, delos, comes from uh, to make manifest. So that's the angle I'm going to be taking with psychedelic today, is that it's a soul manifesting substance, or psychedelic means soul manifesting. So that's a rhyme that uh, Osmond came up with when he suggested this word to uh, Aldous Huxley, which I think speaks perfectly to his soul manifesting, to fathom hell or soar angelic, just take a pinch of psychedelic. And then we've got entrepreneur. Again, a room like this of smart people, you know an entrepreneur is generally somebody that starts a business, starts an organization. I like the etymology of this word as well. It comes from the French entreprendre, which means to undertake something. So the angle I'm going to take today, again, so hopefully I provide value for everybody in the room and I don't end up in jail, is that a psychedelic entrepreneur is one who undertakes manifesting their soul into a business or an organization. And another great quote I found from Osmond while I was doing this research, which, which speaks to what I'm trying to do with this presentation, is it says, there is no one else who can ever fill your role in the same way. So it's a good idea to perform it as well as possible. And I think that's what a psychedelic entrepreneur would do. So I want to share a psychedelic experience that I had that forever changed my life. And that was my first time experiencing the substance DMT. This was back in 2001, I believe. I was bored at my office job. I sold software for a living. So I was on Arrowid.org, as I would do when I was bored. Most people here probably, again, know what Arrowid is. It's a website that describes a whole bunch of different psychotropic substances. And for the first time this day, I had never heard of DMT before. I clicked on DMT, and that's maybe not entirely true. I think I had heard of DMT as the active ingredient in ayahuasca, but I had never heard of it as something that can be taken on its own. And on Arrowhead, it has these experience reports, people describing their experiences with different medicines, and DMT had these beautiful experience reports. Short-lived, smoking it in a pipe, only lasting about five to 10 minutes, but really intense, beautiful experiences. And I said to myself, wow, I need to try this stuff. And the guy I was sharing the office with that day, he was bored as well. He said, do you want to get out of here? I said, sure. We went down to a shop on Commercial Drive in Vancouver that sold a lot of entheogenic substances. It was a shop I hung out at regularly. And even though I hung out there regularly, like I said, I had never heard of DMT before this day. But I walked into this shop on this day, and a stranger I'd never seen before was all of a sudden offering me DMT. So within a four hour window, I hear about the substance and then through some incredible synchronicity, a very meaningful coincidence, all of a sudden the stuff's being offered to me. So I knew the owner of the shop. I asked if I could come back when the shop closed. They had some great beanbag chairs in there, a great lounge area, and three of us partook in the substance that night. And I went last, just a tiny bit of it on a bed of cannabis. I inhaled. And all of a sudden, I felt complete awareness of every cell in my body. And more than that, I could feel my cells being aware of me being aware of them. It was this incredible <laughs> interchange of energy. And then all of a sudden, that exploded to the whole universe. And I could feel every molecule, every particle in the universe being aware of me being aware of it. And there was this incredible love, this incredible benevolence. And as soon as I smoked it, the ego, the English-speaking voice in my head was completely blown out of the way. And I was experiencing this, and it seemed that there was a presence that was guiding the experience. And it, it showed me that every sight I had ever heard, every sound I had ever seen, was sent to me with such intent behind it. It was like each sight and sound or experience was like a FedEx package being delivered directly to me. And it's, it's indicated that this was sa the same for everybody. It was like the, the present was literally pre-sent. And then my, my English-speaking ego got a little traction again and said, well, what? What does this mean? And this presence in its nonverbal way replied, it's perfect. You can't mess it up. Even your ideas of imperfection are built upon an immutable bed of perfection. You can't mess it up. 
You are Christ. You are Buddha. You are the one child of the universe. And paradoxically, so is everybody else. We're perfectly held in this cradle of creation. And you can't mess it up. I said, this is great. Can I go back to normal now? <laughs> and it said, yes, but this is your heritage. This is the consciousness you're trying to work back to without this external substance. This is why you're doing all that spiritual reading. This is what you want to work back to with your own endogenous chemicals. So consciousness returned to my body, and I started jumping for joy. And I, that jump for joy has barely stopped since then in 2001. It really forever changed my life. It was a red pill, blue pill moment from the Matrix, except rather than the reality being this dystopian horror, reality is way better than I ever could have possibly imagined. So I think what I experienced that day, and I'm glad that I've heard mention of it a lot today, is it was like I was given a taste of something called unity consciousness. And I think it's very important for a psychedelic entrepreneur, if you truly want to manifest your soul into something, you need to consider this fact of our unity. Psychedelics often unveil the truth of our unity. Uh, just to save people from admitting they might have broken the law at some point, but just by a show of hands, whether from a substance or not, have you ever experienced this kind of a unity consciousness from psychedelics? Yeah, most of the hands in the room go up. So, it, even on a material level, I, my niece was born, I think around 12 years ago, my first niece, and I wrote her her first letter. I wanted to write her the first letter she ever received. And in the letter, I said, the most important thing to know by far is we are all one. I said, take a rose, for example, your middle name, but a beautiful flower. If you look at a rose, where does the rose end and the something else begin? Is it through the roots? Well, no, because that's where the rose gets water and nutrients from the soil to, soil to build itself. Is it from the air? No, the, the rose breathes just like we do. It, it, would, it wouldn't exist if it weren't for its attachment to the air. Through the light? No, it takes the light and turns it into fuel again that it needs to grow. So even on a material level, and even in a way that you can explain to a child, we are all unified. There is a unity. And it seems as though all spiritual teachings are trying to point us towards this truth of our unity as well. The golden rule. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. That's speaking of unity. Yoga, the Indian tradition, literally means union. A yogi is striving for unity consciousness. This is a quote from the Buddha. He who experiences the unity of life sees his own self in all beings. So I think this is kind of where capitalism has gone wrong in a lot of respects, is capitalism has this incredible force to create things, but if you do that without remembering <coughs> our unity, without remembering that just because you draw a line in the sand and say you're different than me, that doesn't actually make it so, I think it is a very dangerous logical fallacy to think that we're separate and different from each other. From my uh, favorite spiritual teacher, Sadhguru, he says, if you experience everyone as a part of yourself, you do not have to be told how to act in the world. You know how to act in the world. So a psychedelic entrepreneur needs to ask, is this venture in line with the truth of our unity? If you get a solid answer, yes, this venture is in line with the truth of our unity, I think you'll have the power of the whole ocean of the universe behind you when you step into trying to undertake something. Speaking of undertaking something, Entrepreneurship. I got involved in entrepreneurship uh, after I left the hotel business. People had always, I, I grew up in the hotel business, I was quite successful at that at a young age, front desk manager of the Holiday Inn in Whistler when I was only 19. But people always said to me, you'd be such a great salesman. I thought, yeah, I would be a great salesman. So when I left my last hotel job, I applied for a job as a website salesman. And that was a good idea long term, but it was really bad timing because I started as a website salesman. This is a chart of the NASDAQ here. This is where I started selling websites. <laughs> April of 2001, when 
the tech sector had just imploded upon itself. Nobody wanted to speak to anybody about technology. It was horrible. So the other thing is I, I had always been told I would be good at selling, but I learned very quickly that I had no idea how to sell things. There is a certain skill set that I simply was not, I have to actually call, cold call people? In no way, it was horrible. So I was told, go sell some websites. The guy who hired me gave me this book, How to Master the Art of Selling. I started reading it and started feeling dread because this is a book that tells you all the slimy techniques on how to get people to buy things they don't really need. And I went through a very dark night of the soul. And uh, it, was a, it was very dark because I saw my future kind of laid out in front of me being this person I did not want to be. But thankfully, as Joseph Campbell says there, there's a, what does he say there? All seems darkness, then comes new life and all that is needed. So out of this dark night of the soul, I reached out to my boss when I got hired in this job. We had talked about different books that I had read, or that we had each read. And during that interview, he said, have you ever checked out Tony Robbins? And I'm like, uh, Tony Robbins, that uh, guy with the teeth from the infomercials? Um, no, I haven't checked him out, thanks. You can keep Tony Robbins to yourself. But thankfully, through some act of grace, out of this dark night of the soul, I said, Paul, can you lend me that Tony Robbins book that you told me about? And he lent me this book, Awaken the Giant Within. And honestly, it was like mother's milk to me. I read, it's a huge tome, I read the first half of that book so quickly. It talked about identifying your limiting beliefs and how they might be holding you back, different beliefs and values that might be holding you back. And then another amazing synchronicity happened, is I lived in Kitsilano in Vancouver near the beach. I was coming back from the beach one day, and I saw a guy that was going through the garbage looking for bottles or cans, and I said, I've got a bunch of empty wine bottles in my apartment, let me go grab them for you. So I grabbed them, I brought them out to him, and this was two days after I started reading this book. He said, look, down here, there's a bunch of tapes down here. If you don't like these tapes, you can just record over them. You got a whole bunch of blank tapes. Lo and behold, in front of me was the entire 30-day Tony Robbins personal power. <laughs> the thing he'd been selling on the infomercials for $300. Half of these were still in the wrapper. And seriously, if I had have found these two weeks before, I would have laughed and said the guy with the teeth and kept walking. But I didn't do that. I had to buy a tape player. And I called in sick for the next two days. It was a Thursday, Friday, leading into a weekend. I spent the next four days walking around Vancouver, listening to the entire 30 days in four days. And honestly, again, my life has never been the same. Some takeaways from the Tony Robbins material itself. Uh, he's got a new Netflix documentary called I Am Not Your Guru. Check that out if you haven't. It's really good. But Tony Robbins encourages you to raise your standards. He encourages you to look at, identify, and then change your limiting beliefs. He encourages you to look at different strategies when things aren't serving you. He encourages you to realize that decisions control your destiny, and that if you truly decide to, you can do almost anything. So this was great in and of itself. But what this really did for me is it opened a door for me towards a whole new realm of material that, again, I had kind of laughed at in the past. That whole field called personal development or self-help. So Robbins introduced me to things like Ralph Waldo Emerson's essay on self-reliance. Anybody who wants to start a business, anybody who wants to be an entrepreneur or blaze new trails, you've got to read that essay on self-reliance, and not just once. Napoleon Hill's book, Think and Grow Rich. Again, capitalism has really screwed up the world, so people don't like the word rich very much, or it's a lot of people I know. They've got this love-hate relationship with being successful on that level. If you don't like the word rich, Let's say, think and grow into whatever you want with your life. Think and Grow Rich is not a capitalistic book. It's a psychotherapeutic book. It teaches you mindset. There's chapters on desire. There's chapters on faith. It's almost a spiritual text. Again, don't stop at one reading of Think and Grow Rich. 
This type of material contains the information slash inspiration one needs to soldier on as an entrepreneur. Because if you're going to be an entrepreneur, if you're going to start something on your own, you're not going to have your boss threatening to fire you if you don't get things done. It just won't get done and your life won't move forward. So digging into that whole realm of personal development or self-help material, that's, you know, it's not taught in our modern day education system, but I really think it's the missing ingredient if we wanted to turn our kids into powerful forces of creation. This is the kind of information they need. So one of the things that uh, chapter 3 in Think and Grow Rich is actually titled Faith. And it's not religious faith. It's not believing in some God in robes up in the heavens. It's about faith as an operating principle. So faith as the opposite of fear. Both are simply expectations of things, things to come, except Fear induces a standstill or even backwards movement, whereas faith invites a forward movement. So an entrepreneur needs to have faith in themselves. They have to have faith in their project, and they have to have faith in the goals that they're setting. That's what I'd like to speak about now, is goal setting as, as a psychedelic entrepreneur. This is a great quote from Williams College in Massachusetts. It says, climb high, climb far. Your goal, the sky, but your aim, the star. So aiming for the star, that's an unreasonable goal. But in the meantime, you're going to reach the sky. So doing, being a goal-setting entrepreneur, you need to be unreasonable. You need a compelling goal that's going to pull you forward when there's not a lot of wind in your sails. You're going to need to think about that goal and say, oh yeah, that fires me up a little bit. Some of the worst advice I've been given by very well-meaning people, people who love me dearly, and I guess they just don't want me to be disappointed with how my life ends up, but they say, don't get your hopes up. <laughs> what kind of garbage is that? An entrepreneur, especially a psychedelic entrepreneur, somebody who really wants to put their soul into their venture, you really need to get your hopes up. If you don't know what kind of goal you're going to set, Think about doing the rocking chair visualization. What that is, is imagine you're 115, 120 years old, sitting on your front porch, looking back at your life. What are those things you regret not having accomplished? That's a great place to start in your goal setting, is make sure you're not that person who's sitting on the rocking chair, regretful about those things they didn't accomplish. Don't worry about how you're going to achieve your goal. That's a non-starter. If you get all caught up in the details about how you're going to achieve this the sky goal of aiming the star, you're never going to get there. You're, the how is where the magic comes in. Set the goal and let the magic happen. In fact, I say here, allow for the mystical. I think psychedelics are a pretty mystical tool to use. And mystical... Mystical at first seems maybe something that's outside of the realm of the laws of nature, but I think it's more like if I, 200 years ago, came into a room like this and said, I'm going to hit this switch at the side here, and it's going to flood the room with light, 200 years ago you might have thought I was a god, or at least a mystic for doing that. Now we understand the laws of electricity a little bit more. I think that's what mysticism kind of leads to is it's pointing to something that we don't quite understand quite yet but I think it is still within the realm of the laws of nature and on that note I'd like to speak about synchronicity I've heard good talk of synchronicity so far I think Rick Doblin talked about how some things just happened for him one of the best stories of synchronicity I've ever heard in my life is how Richard uh, Jensen and Donna Dreyer met on an airplane one day um, synchronicity um, Hayden spoke about serendipity somehow coming in to him working on the MDMA study. So when I thought about presenting synchronicity here, I didn't know it was going to be brought up a few times before this presentation. So I thought I better show that there are some people who are much smarter than me who have also considered synchronicity or meaningful coincidence something worth studying. So Schopenhauer, a philosopher from the mid-1800s, he wrote a paper on the apparent design in the fate of the individual. He's talking about synchronicity there. 
a modern day mystic, a contemporary mystic, Joseph Campbell, he says, when we follow our bliss, we are met by a thousand unseen hands. He's speaking about synchronicity there. A longer quote here, but the bold part in the middle is that the moment one definitely commits, then providence moves too. All sorts of things occur to help one that never would have otherwise occurred. So these are all pointing to synchronicity, and Carl Jung is the man that actually coined the term synchronicity. He wrote a great paper on it, which is now available in book form, but his conclusion <coughs> is what I'll point to here, is that synchronicity needs thorough consideration, and psychology or psychotherapy of all the sciences cannot afford to overlook such experiences. So synchronicity. Synchronicity is a subjective or internal experience that aligns with one or more objective or external experiences. And I put seemingly in italics there because it says seemingly without cause. I have a feeling that there is a cause, we just don't understand it yet. And as an entrepreneur, as a psychedelic entrepreneur, what is a goal but first a subjective experience? So once a goal is set that you're holding in mind inside yourself that you don't know how to accomplish, the question is, can synchronicity be leveraged? And I think that it can. Synchronicity, the mechanism of manifestation, a psychedelic entrepreneur's formula to leverage synchronicity. Again, we talked about faith as an operating principle. You're not going to be able to prove this right or wrong unless you have faith to give this formula a go. But number one, I say set a big goal that's harmonized with the truth of our unity. If it's harmonized with the truth of our unity, if you're in line with the highest and best good for all, you're not going to have a whole bunch of other vibrations trying to cancel it out. Every, the whole universe is going to want you to accomplish your goal. Number two, make sure you've got a burning desire for its achievement. Chapter two in Think and Grow Rich is all about desire. Desire is that compelling force that makes you want to achieve something. Number three, don't worry about how it's going to get accomplished. Number four, hold faith as your operating principle. Number five, move forward with the next obvious steps. So it's great to philosophize about your project, but at the end of the day, you gotta take action. You can meditate all you want, but if you know you need to make a phone call, you gotta make that phone call. If you know you need to go do some research, you gotta get off your butt and go do that new research. So this, there's a lot of philosophizing in this presentation, perhaps, but at the end of the day, Liberty Root was formed because I got off my butt and made phone calls and took people for lunch and built networks and researched what I wanted to do with this business. Number six, expect and welcome the mystical. So if, don't get discouraged because you don't know how you're going to accomplish your goal. Allow that the mystical is going to have your back. And number seven, leave room for all manners of synchronicity to show you the next steps as that how is unveiled. And that's the exciting part. And it was an exciting uh, thing for me. This is how this all came together, where psychedelics met entrepreneurship for me, was because, you know, in 2001, around the same time that I had that uh, uni unity mystical experience with the DMT, I realized, wow, if we're all one, I should maybe stop being so selfish and should maybe look at ways that I can try and help the world since I'm one with the whole world. So rightly or wrongly, my new city of Vancouver seemed to have a bit of an issue that could use some assistance in the neighborhood called the downtown east side, which has been called the poorest postal code in Canada. So 2001, I just started doing a lot of research. I started looking at the problem, maybe with fresh eyes, uh, going downtown a lot, meeting people. That didn't turn into much until uh, 2005. And I had an idea, and this was my kind of pie-in-the-sky goal, is wouldn't it be great if I could create a profitable venture helping the downtown east side, which then I could use the profits to help the downtown east side even more. So that seemed impossible when I had that goal. But... Uh, the way I started with that is uh, 
I, had, I, I decided I'd get some t-shirts printed up and sell those t-shirts, and I'd use the profits of the t-shirt sales to help the downtown east side. <coughs> so that wasn't a very good idea. Number one, I'm not a very good t-shirt salesman. Uh, number two, I didn't know what I was going to do with the profits, even if I made them. So again, I took a more boots-to-the-ground approach. I actually moved in to the Belmont student residence for a month at uh, the corner of Hastings in Maine. That wasn't a very good idea either. There's a, it's a very apathetic energy down there, so I didn't get a lot done. Um, but I did find out about Vandu, the Vancouver Area Network of Drug Users. I took a guy for lunch once when I was down there. He said, you need to go speak to Vandu. So newly printed t-shirts in hand, I walked into Vandu. They were in the middle of a crack cocaine users group. And the woman that was running the meeting, she came up to me and said, you know, what are you doing? I said, I got these t-shirts helping the downtown east side. It's going to be awesome. And she's like, okay. She went back to the front of the room and she said, all right, we're going to have a smoke break. And when we come back, we've got a guest speaker. <laughs> so, uh, there's a bumper sticker that says the world is changed by those who show up. And I saw the truth in that that day. But... I, like I said, I wasn't a very good uh, t-shirt salesman, so I ran out of money fairly quickly. I had friends who, had, who worked on cruise ships, and they had always told me that I'd be great on cruise ships. So I thought, maybe this is my chance to go work on cruise ships. And I'll tell you, very specifically, I thought before working on ships that if I'm going to have the impact I want to have on the world, I'm going to need to be a better public speaker. And cruise ships are going to give me that opportunity. So my goal getting on cruise ships, I started at the lowest rung of the entertainment department ladder. My goal was to be a cruise director within a year. Everybody said impossible, but through incredible synchronicities and powerful goal setting, within eight months I became a cruise director. That's a picture of me on a cruise ship. And I met the woman who became my wife. She happens to be here right now. We weren't all that good at husband and wife, but we are still best friends, so it's great to have Becky here. We got married and moved back to Vancouver in 2009, and I thought, all right, I'm going to go do my downtown east side thing again. So on my first day back to the downtown east side, I took a bus to the corner of Hastings and Maine. I got off at Hastings and Maine. I started walking down Hastings. And right next to Insight, the safe injection site, there is a, a vacant lot which had a garden in it. And this is a picture, I found this online, and in the back there you can see there's a frame of a structure there. And it was a covered frame when I went there. I walked in, I'm like, are you guys having a sweat lodge? And they're like, yeah, do you want to join us? So again, a very meaningful coincidence for me is I was literally reinitiated into the downtown east side when I got there that day. Most powerful sweat lodge of my life. I was actually sick for two days after. That's never happened to me before. But it was intense. And a couple of weeks later, I arranged a meeting with Anne Livingston, who was the founder of Van Du, and sat down with her and said, look, I've got this dream of trying to help the downtown east side. What do you think I might be able to do to help out down here? She was very gracious. She sat with me for a couple of hours. We batted around different ideas. Didn't really hit on anything, but the whole time I was speaking to her, there was this folder on the wall behind her. And in the last 10 minutes of that conversation, I said to her, what about Ibogaine? As I mentioned, I used to hang out at a shop that sold entheogenic substances. So I knew what Ibogaine was, I knew that it had anti-addictive properties, but I had never put two and two together as a way that that might be able to help the downtown east side. But lo and behold, as synchronicity would have it, I asked that question and she said, actually, I have people calling me for that all the time. Again, remarkably, uh, the Iboga Therapy House was the first place in Canada, that's what uh, Rick mentioned in there, that had Ibogaine therapy, they were closed down. Their website was still up though, and Anne's name was attached to that website as somebody that might be able to provide more information. So I said, I'm going to follow that thread. Let me look into that. So for a couple of years, that didn't go very far, except I got lots of calls. and forwarded a lot of calls to me. Uh, Anne introduced me to Mark Hayden, who was very gracious. We had a meeting at Vancouver Coastal Health about Ibogaine. I, I, I didn't think I wanted to work with Ibogaine, to be honest. It seemed a bit out of my league, but then I got another, 
amazing phone call from Ann Livingston one day that said, uh, did you know there's a Ibogaine Providers Conference in town? No, and she said, well, I put you on the list as a provider, you should go down. So that's where I met the guy who became my business partner who had been trained in properly providing Ibogaine. Uh, th there's a whole bunch of amazing hows and connections. I was introduced to Donna Dreyer, took her for lunch, she was very encouraging. Amazing, amazing synchronicities led to the formation of Liberty Root Therapy Limited. This is the front page of our website. You see or not up top there, it does say Downtown East Side Program. So we take people who can't afford our treatment, set aside a little money from every treatment, and then give back to the Downtown East Side community as well. So I have been able to treat a bunch of people for free from the Downtown East Side. And that for me is where psychedelics met entrepreneurship. And I would now like to leave you with the psychedelic entrepreneur's suitcase. So, I've already mentioned a couple of resources. I mentioned Ralph Waldo Emerson's essay on self-reliance. I mentioned Napoleon Hill. If you want to be a psychedelic entrepreneur, you should dig into all of Napoleon Hill's material. I'm going to mention a few more books. And I'm only going to mention a few books, number one, because I know if you put enough books in a suitcase, it gets heavy very quick. But um, I want you to... Look at these books in two ways. Number one, I believe that if you completely had faith in each one of these books that I'm going to mention, they're the only books you need. On the other hand, I have found that as you read certain books, they lead you to the next books you need to read. So I already mentioned Think and Grow Rich. I'd also like to mention The Science of Getting Rich by Wallace Waddles. This is much more concise. It's only 80 pages long. Again, if you don't like the word rich, the science of getting whatever you want out of life. It is a psychotherapeutic text. There's a chapter on gratitude. You know, it's, it fixes your mindset to allow for abundance. The Astonishing Power of Emotions is another book I highly recommend. An entrepreneur needs to be able to control their emotions. In the face of incredible adversity, you need to be able to shift the context so that you don't get bowled under and want to quit everything during those tough times. Astonishing Power of Emotions is a great tool that way. I mentioned Sadhguru earlier. This is called Inner Engineering, A Yogi's Guide to Joy. Again, an entrepreneur needs to be able to maintain their interiority. Inner Engineering is a great concept, and this book is newly released, only a few weeks old, and it's got a lot of very powerful stuff in there. I'd also like to mention the rule of five. So I mentioned earlier that sometimes the rubber needs to be hitting the road. You need to be sure that you're not just philosophizing, philosophizing about your dreams. You need to make sure you're actually implementing those dreams. So the rule of five, the way I heard about it, is think about a sharp axe. You take that sharp axe, you go outside, you swing that axe just five times, three, four, five, you set that axe down, you go inside, you wait till the next day, you go outside, you swing that axe just five more times. Only five times a day, super easy, not too much sweat, but eventually, if you do that day in, day out, eventually what's going to happen? That tree's going to fall. So the rule of five is five things that you do every day in order to make sure that you're moving your life forward. My first rule of five, and this is, this is a tool we treat addicts as well. So there is the habit force that they have been using to, you know, maybe dig their life into a hole. That same habit force can be used towards creating a beautiful and creative life. The rule of five keeps people on track. My first rule of five Five things I did every day was number one, I made sure I meditate every day. Number two, I made sure I made 20 sales calls for my software job every day. That software job financed Liberty Root when we were getting going. Number three is I made sure I worked on my fledgling business every day. That turned into Liberty Root. Number four is I made sure that I exercised mind and body. So that was learning something every day and breaking a sweat every day. And number five was an enrichment activity. 
um, whether playing guitar or learning a new language, that was my number five. So I had five simple things that I did every single day to make sure that I was moving my, my life forward. I could sleep like a baby anytime I did that rule of five because I, kn I knew that I had done what needed to be done that day. Wow. <laughs> you can see you. <laughs> but the power is still on in the laptop. <laughs> So, <laughs> I'll just keep going. Um, so, rule of five, yes. And does this still work? No. Oh, no, that doesn't work. <laughs> so, the next thing... <laughs> the next thing in the psychedelic entrepreneur's suitcase was the microdose. So... I, you may or may not have heard of ingesting a small subperceptual amount of a psychedelic substance. Apparently, it's all the rage in Silicon Valley right now. Um, of course, use a legal psychedelic substance. Will that come back down now? Yeah, sure. I'm just protecting myself again. Don't want to end up in jail. But a sub-perceptual amount of a psychedelic substance, it opens you up. It allows for a bit more creativity. It gives in, You get hit with insights when you microdose. It's a great tool for an entrepreneur. And the last thing I had here was unity in community. So we're together with a whole bunch of like-minded people. We need to leverage the love and the support that these like-minded people can give you. I had the incredible good fortune of being a part of Richard and Donna's psychedelic psychotherapy training this year. And it was me and nine other people along with Richard and Donna that met for uh, three weeks this summer, three one-week sessions, and really went deep and learned a lot about each other. And now we know we've all got each other's backs moving forward. So really leverage community when you can find it, unity in community. So this slide, again, I cleverly said, coming down, wrapping up our trip. <laughs> Some points I'd like to leave you with is a psychedelic entrepreneur needs to search their soul for a venture that is in line with the truth of our unity. A psychedelic entrepreneur needs to seek goals that keep the wind in their sails against all odds. A psychedelic entrepreneur needs a modus operandi of faith. A psychedelic entrepreneur needs to set inspired goals and not worry about the how. And finally, I'll leave you with the story. The slide here says the purpose of life. So the last time I did a large psychedelic session for myself personally is as an ibogaine provider, I like to take a large dose of ibogaine or iboga at least once a year. And uh, the last time I did that was in May. I had a friend in Squamish who um, gave me, uh, who's been trained in more shamanic ways with the medicine, and essentially what he did is when I was at the peak of my iboga journey, he came over and took me through visualization exercises. One of the things he did was have me go into my front yard of my house. He said, are there any trees there? And there was, it was May. So the tree I have in the front yard was a big, beautiful, blossomed cherry tree. So this big, pink, flowery tree. He said, go give that tree a hug. So I went up and I gave that tree a hug. And then he said, ask that tree what the purpose of life is. I said, tree, what's the purpose of life? And it said, to flower. And then there's a question around negative tendencies and how to keep negative tendencies out of your life. So I asked this question, and the tree said, stop watering your weeds. So what I would like to leave you with is a blessing and hope that if you do have negative tendencies that you know are holding you back, you stop watering your weeds, and that you do find that purpose in life and flower to every one of you. Thank you.
you. I don't know if there's time for questions, if you have any. Kevin kind of gave me a one minute warning a second ago. <laughs> Are there any quick questions? Yes. Have you tried microdosing with various psychedelic substances? And is there one that you find <coughs> creativity and focus? So iboga is legal and is a great thing to microdose. Uh, like uh, just getting the root bark of iboga itself and maybe having, you know, start with a quarter of a gram of iboga root bark. That's a great one. And every day or is it like every three days? You'll you feel, I, I, you know, it's, you can't abuse that one. Right. You know, you, you, get to, you get intuitions pretty quickly if you've had too much or shouldn't be using it. But, you know, I know people who have gone a few days. I know people that have gone a few weeks with that. It's a, it's a nice one. And root bark's fairly safe to work with as well. Yeah, um, you. you know, I've heard stories LSD works great, you know, to kind of... You know, a tenth of a hit of LSD, right. 10 micrograms of LSD. James Fadiman writes a lot about that, the Psychedelic Explorer's Guide. He's the one that's done the most research on microdosing, I think. But yeah, great insights. And seems to be, uh, uh, it, it, you have more synchronicities when you're <laughs> microdosing, I find. The right phone calls come at the right time, different things. Yeah. It's neat, yeah. I tried microdosing just psilocybin so far. Psilocybin's a great one. Yeah, yeah. yeah. A loopy for me, like it was fun. But yeah, maybe, not. maybe go a bit lower dose. <laughs> Should be sub perception. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? If not, no. Awesome. Well, yeah. Um, I find it interesting to get into the space with legality issues and whatnot. So I guess it's just a waiting game. It's when it comes to entrepreneurship, or is there people that are expressing their entrepreneurial ways regardless of the... I think that there are. There is an underground scene, but I, you know, if I was setting a goal, a pie-in-the-sky goal, it would be ending prohibition in Canada, you know? It would be making it so that I can work legally with this, these medicines. I don't know how I'm going to accomplish that. Prohibition's the next big thing on my radar. I'm actually, the legalities, we're speaking about it at a panel, panel right now. I'm on that panel. But prohibition needs to go. It hasn't worked since they tried to outlaw booze. You, you know, the, the United States, is they outlaw, they have the strictest uh, drug laws. They also have the highest rate of drug abuse. If prohibition worked, great, but it obviously <coughs> doesn't. So It's serving some interests. It is definitely serving some interests. Yeah. It's working for some. Yes. Right? It's just not yeah. working for yeah. the rest of us. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes, sir. Are there issues, if even with a legal substance such as Ibogaine, you would have concerns about training, of sourcing, of accountability and liability? For sure. You know, like I, I haven't been able to get insurance for what I do. I always say that I am my own insurance policy, and I don't know how well that's going to work long term. Uh, we're going to speak a bit more about that in that panel, actually. I'll go through some of the... the Things that I found out about the legality of ibogaine itself, which, you know, it's still a bit of a gray area. All right. Thanks, everybody. Have a good day.